Good evening and welcome to Admin Chat, which we are delighted this evening to be holding, interviewing the World Authority on the Role of the Assistant, S. Lloyd. Good evening, S. Hi, Lucy, and of course here it is definitely evening, and for you I know it's morning, but it's just such a delight to be talking to you. Oh, wonderful to be talking to you too. Um, I wonder if we could start just by doing some background about you. Where are you from? What did your family do? Tell us a bit about you. Um, so, I'm a New Zealander, and I was born and raised in a very small part, um, a very uh, remote part of New Zealand called French Pass. It has that name because it was actually uh, navigated by sea by the French explorer, Dumont Deville. And it's a very, very small village. It had half a dozen houses, um, a hall and a school. And my father was the local shopkeeper. So we had the only shop in the village. And all of our produce that came into that shop, which generally was dry goods because most people grew their own vegetables and grew their own meat, um, all came in by ship. Because until I was seven years old, we didn't have a road. And it was up not until I had left home when I was 17 that we finally got Maine's electricity. So it was remote. We had a particularly tiny school. And when I started school, there were nine pupils, which was just enough to have a state-provided school teacher. However, by the time I left the primary school to go to secondary school, with the in, um, incoming road, we actually had a bus. And we had grown to the grand number of 22 pupils. <laughs> Probably the downside for me was that all through my primary schooling, I was the only child of my age in my class. And I don't know that that was particularly good for me. Oh, you didn't do terribly well at education, did you, Ash? I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. I found it difficult. In fact, on my first day at school, five, at um, morning break time, I left the school and went home, because actually I'd had enough already. <laughs> so, probably, of course, my mother sent me back again, but that was entirely beside the point. I had felt that I had done school, and there were other things I had learned to do. So generally, my schooling, I didn't find schooling that good. I did reasonably well at primary school, but by the time I hit secondary school, I was off the whole idea of all together. Yes, you went away to secondary school, didn't you? Yes, so we were two to two and a half hours drive from the nearest city, and that city had a girls' boarding school, so it was Nelson College for Girls. So I spent five years at boarding school, and again, I don't think that was a good thing for me. I came from quite a large family, so I had five siblings, and all of them were older than me, and of the of the six of us, um, only myself and one of my older brothers actually actively disliked boarding school. The others all really enjoyed it. But one of my older brothers, Bill, and I, we really and truly did not like being at boarding school. We didn't like that whole confined environment. Not enjoying boarding school actually made day-to-day -day schoolwork more and more of a challenge. So when I left I had only achieved one of my two school state exams and actually came out of school feeling that I was something of a failure and definitely a disappointment to my mother, who was a little different from women in her era in that she had gained a Bachelor of Arts at Victoria University in Wellington in 1936, which was something fairly unusual for women in that time. So it wasn't that I didn't have an environment schooling was valued, it was quite simply that I didn't like it and it didn't fit me. You lost her quite early, didn't you? Yes, it was, it, I, my mother died when I was 17. She had actually been ill since I was 11, so while I was the youngest of the family, by the time I was 12, I was the only child still at home. So I did spend quite a bit of time um, looking after my mother. And I think our relationship slightly slipped from being 
heard the parent and meet the child, to meet the parent and heard the child. Um, she was mostly pretty ill. And that too didn't set me up well for boarding school because I went there feeling like a little grown up. There is nothing an 11 or 12 year old girl likes better on the whole than to be the adult in the house. And so that's what I took to with glee. And school and boarding school were not for me. No. So you've actually got quite an amazing story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you started off in the administrative profession? Yes, it's rather silly. I became, I became a secretary because when I um, made my decision as to what career I was going to go into, um, the options that were available in the late uh, 1960s to young women were generally teaching, nursing, secretarial, hairdressing, or working in a shop. Sure, there were a few others, but those were the more common employment options. If you were very clever and you were in the A stream of school, you might have had that opportunity of being um, uh, able to go to university and perhaps being a secondary school teacher rather than a primary school teacher. So I chose initially and applied to go to Teachers Training College and I was accepted. However, because I had failed my final exams, I was going to be earning a thousand dollars less than my peers who were going who had achieved that exam. And frankly, that made me very grumpy. And so I decided that secretarial work was much better. And in hindsight, it actually was the right decision. So I moved from the small town of Nelson to the larger capital city of Wellington, and I attended what was an effective technical college, Wellington Polytechnic, and I undertook a one-year secretarial certificate course. Okay. Um, and then from that, um, what happened next? So I then applied, and this was one of the things that was fascinating about the late 1960s in New Zealand, I applied for something like five or six secretarial positions and was accepted for all of them. Today, if you apply for one, two, three hundred jobs, you might, if you're lucky, get one or two or three interviews. I got all the interviews and I got accepted for all the jobs. The one that I took was as secretary to the three directors for a department store in Wellington, which was quite a big one, called James Smith's Limited. And we actually in Wellington still have Jane Smith's Corner, although Jane Smith's, the department store, is long gone. It's bizarre to think that as a 18-year-old straight out of secretarial college, I was able to go straight in as a secretary, but that was the employment market at the time. I had a number of jobs after that. One or two um, were quite short-lived. One I actually got fired from. And I always thought that was a bit unfair because I got the job and started the job on the first day and went down with a streak throat. I honestly and truly was really sick. It was working in a legal firm, which I'd never worked in before. And the person I was working for, the lawyer, invited me into his office, gave me a full shorthand notebook, full of shorthand, and sent me off to type it up. I was feeling really unwell. I didn't recognise many of the characters I had to make up on the fly to match the legal terms. And the next day, in fact, for the next three days or four days, I was unable to go to work. When I returned to work on Friday, he fired me. I'm glad that employment relations have improved in New Zealand since then. However, it was a good experience because I learned a bit about myself. And that was about the fact that you need to be wee bit proactive as to what you can manage and I needed to have said to them, can I just do take this first letter and go back and work with it and come back to you later. So it was it was an experience. You're also I, not the greatest on. at uh, making tea either, tea or coffee. It isn't your thing, yeah, is it? That came later. Because after that um, those early positions, uh, Charles and I, my husband and I moved overseas, we moved to the UK. And I got a job in Northampton working for a, an architect. And this was when the tea making came to the core because I do not drink tea or coffee. One particular 
day, he invited me into his office to take column dictation and a whole big stack, I had a big stack of files of things that he needed done on them. And he wanted them all by lunchtime because he was going off to London and he had to sign them. And as I went out the door, he said, and would you make me a cup of tea? Now, in itself, that's fine. But you have to understand, I was in one of those English buildings where every room was on a different floor. And the tea-making facilities were on the top floor. And I would had to run up and down the stairs, getting the tea and all the mugs, taking them all the way down to the ladies' type, um, toilet on the second floor and washing them all in the hand basin with a tea towel spread over the top of the loo. I mean, how hygienic is that? And then run back upstairs and make the tea and then run back downstairs with the tea. And in between all of that, as I was sole charge, run up and down answering the telephone. Now, this was about 1972, I believe. It was in the days of the cold strike in New Zealand and the in, in UK and the three-day working week. And um, as I went to go out the door, I turned around, slammed the files down on the front of his desk and said, what in heaven's name do you want, your work or your tea? And he almost fell off his chair. He was so surprised. And then I said, you have a room full of dra young draftsmen upstairs who are perfectly capable of, capable of making tea, and I don't even drink it. I was never asked to make tea again, and I was looked at as being a very bolshy Kiwi, I have to say. <laughs> Good for you. I moved on to Bermuda, and I lived in Bermuda for four years and had a job there working for a, a lovely person for four years and then back to New Zealand when a whole bunch of things, such as starting family and so on, and different jobs. And the first time I worked in my own business as well. So a lot of variety, a lot of variety. And working in other countries is definitely um, something that you grow from. Very definitely. And you've just got back from a year in Samoa, haven't you? Yes, so 19, uh, 2013 through to the end of 2014, Charles and I went to Samoa working on volunteer service abroad, and that was the time when I really and truly used my administrative skills, because I had a lot of years as an administrator. By then, I had been working in my own business, working with administrators to help them gain their national qualifications. I had undertaken my thesis, and I was taken in as a administration services advisor. And it was a truly satisfying role, although in hindsight, I'm not sure that what I did, although it may have helped the one person in Samoa that I trained, I'm not sure that what I did had any lasting impact on, on Samoa, which is part of what you do as a volunteer or you hope to do. So yes, that's an amazing experience. We're getting ahead of ourselves. I think, um, we I think we should go back the story. So you went back to New Zealand and you discovered your professional home, the AAPNZ. I did. So in, I started work in about 1970, late 69 I think it was, and in 1972 an organisation was formed that was then called the New Zealand Society of Executive Secretaries, but I knew nothing about that even though it was set up by the, the head of school at the Polytechnic I had gone to. I, by 72, I was in the UK, I had moved on, and I knew nothing about this new association. It wasn't until 1997 that my boss, when I was working at the Institute of Geological and Nuclear Sciences, my boss, Dr. Robin Courtney, said to me, there has to be a professional association out there that you can join I need you to go out, find it, and join it, and no, I don't have the budget to be able to pay the fees. Nothing changes. And so I did. <laughs> and so I did. I found it, I joined it, and I have ever since, until I was made a life member, have paid my own fees, because actually, I was the person who gained the most benefit from it. And tell us a bit about the AAPNZ, because obviously it's a um, uh, New Zealand association, and those of um, the people out there who don't come from New Zealand probably don't know what it is. Yes, so up until 
year 2000, it was the New Zealand Society of Executive Secretaries. And New Zealand, along with many other countries in the world, including um, the United States, at that, around about that time, started to change their name from being executive secretaries and being somewhat exclusive to being administrative or office professionals. And in actual fact, representing and providing a professional home for a bigger range of people working in our administrative profession. So in 2000, NZ um, SES became the Association of Administrative Professionals New Zealand Inc., so AAPNZ, and it has been called that ever since. I joined in 97, but in 2000, I was asked by AAPNZ, along with my friend Trisha Hawley, to become the co-conveners for the AAPNZ, although we still had not quite made that name yet, it was still a year away, um, become the co-conveners for their conference annual general meeting and what was then called the International Secretarial Summit, which is now called the World Administrative Summit. So there have been a lot of changes in names, which can be really confusing for people trying to research back into things. But actually, it's to do with the fact that the role has changed. There aren't only secretaries. There now are a range of titles, and we can come to that later. Yeah. What did you find that you gained from being part of the AAPNZ? Because I think it's a great lesson for anybody thinking about joining an association. I think I probably gained biggest range of opportunities in my life through AAPNZ. There was one thing that I did quite some time before I joined that, and that was to be a member of Toastmasters, so to become comfortable getting up and presenting, and that fed into what I did within AAPNZ. But I took the opportunity to put my hand up and say, yes, I will do that. For example, the conference in 2000. For example, in 2002, saying, yes, I will become national president. I learned more about leadership skills, more about working with a team and leading a team, more about mentoring, more about working with others than I could ever have learned to work to have in my own job. Very often, an administrative professional might work as part of a team, but sometimes they're seen as being on the periphery of that team. Sometimes they might lead a team of other administrators, but in the recent survey we've got very, very few people in comparison with the number of answers actually have that opportunity. So taking a role within your own professional association gives you a very large number of opportunities to grow. And I found that once I started putting my hand up and saying, yes, I'll do that. One, it became easier, and two, I gained more skills and was able to contribute more. I have been, and frankly, Lucy, sitting here today, talking with you, has more to do with my membership of AAPNZ than almost anything else. That's just wonderful. And you are, in fact, only one of five life members ever awarded for AAPNZ, aren't you? I am, and, and that was one of the biggest honours that they could ever have given me. In fact, the statement made after it by the members of my own Wellington group was that, boy, we've actually managed to make it speechless, which was <laughs> quite true. Um, it's just, the, the five members, the original life member was Doreen Smart, who was the founder, and the other three members had been myself. Um, are people who have, in the eyes of the association, contributed an enormous amount. You can't apply to be a life member. You can only be nominated. You're not told that you're nominated. You only receive it if the national executive team agree. Otherwise, you would never know anything about it. So it is a true honour. A little bit, not quite as prestigious as your recent one with IAM, but a little bit like that, in that it is seen as being something that recognises the value you have contributed, in my case, to my own association, in your case, 
actually to the world. So it's something to be looked at, smiled at, and have that warm inner glow about. Absolutely. Um, and, and then all of this has led you to take on um, the World Administrators Summit, which is um, just coming up this year in Germany. I wonder if you can give us a bit of history about World Summit, because I think some people confuse it with a conference, and it's very definitely not that. No, the most significant thing about the, the World Summit is that it is attended by no more than three delegates from every country who is able to have delegates there. The delegates are there to work. There's a preset agenda that has topics that have been determined in the past purely by going to associations and asking them what topics they want. But this time we've gone out to the world and asked the world of administrative professionals what topics they want. And these topics um, are then condensed down into a group of no more than four topics. So we, we slot in underneath the four major topics the other topics that link. And then we provide all of that information to the facilitators who lead the discussions. So the delegates go there. And while there's a welcome reception, and there um, are at least one, maybe two, casual networking dinners, and there's a final dinner, the rest of the time your delegates are working really hard. So that is the significant difference between a conference and a working summit. So the history of it, it started first in 1992, when the United States Association, now called IAAP, invited the associations from around the world to meet together, to share the issues of their associations, but also the issues of their profession. They met first in um, New York, and then from then on, approximately every three years, so Seattle, South Africa, New Zealand, and so on. There's London, Trinidad, Tobago, New Zealand again, Australia, fabulous. However, what has become more clear in recent times is that the countries that don't have a form of association also did not have a voice. And so we've begun to change the rules to enable an individual to be a representative, a delegate of a country, but again, still no more than three, because those individuals bring a representation, usually primarily from the organisation they work with, but they're often people who are passionate about the profession, so they still represent their country. So that is the most significant difference. One of the difficulties that um, the World Summit had in the past was that because most of these associations around the world are voluntary, any documentation of discussions, outcomes, solutions, suggestions was sent in hard copy by snail mail to one person. Now that person most likely did share it, but they shared it with, of course, the people of their time, and then that document was filed and actually became lost because by the time, three years later, the next one came around, there would be new people in that leadership role within that country, within that association. And so they, we discovered by the time I became involved in 2000, and then again 2003, that we were beginning to talk about the same topics because we weren't being able to share that information widely enough. So one of the very exciting things about Frankfurt is that we now, of course, have the internet. And so on our website called the World Summit, there are actually the very few historical documents that we've been able to pull together of past events that are up there. Now, one of those really amazing documents came out of 2006 in the Gold Coast in Australia, and that's called Administra. Now, it's Ministra is subtitled the World Action Plan. What it really is, is a set of guidelines for both associations and individuals around setting goals. And some of the goals, for example, 
are managing administrative and office professional skills. And that's for an association, but for an individual, it is managing your administrative skills. So there are four major goals in there. Moving with the times in the 21st century or keeping up with technology in the 21st century is another goal. Now, the story about the name of Administra is one I must share with you. The Australian um, Association, which is the, Australia, the Australian Institute of Office Professionals, um, decided they wanted to give something to what was then called the International Secretarial Summit. And so one of the members had the bright idea of checking with um, those who, who name the stars in the heavens as to whether a new star had been found recently. And they found that one had. And so they asked and, and then purchased the naming rights to that star. And so they have named that star Administrar for all administrative professionals in the world. And so that's why that became such an appropriate title for our World Action Plan. And actually, I found that one of the most amazing things they could have done, because that's ours forever. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you look up, you know you're connected to all the other administrative professionals in the world. You are. That's wonderful. Absolutely. So this is, to me, and you know how excited I am about Summit coming up, because I think that it's a really small opportunity, small window to make history. Um, not least because it's the first time since London in, I can't remember which year, but I mean several years, that we have actually come to this side of the world. Um, tell us a little bit about that, Eth. Yes, so 2003 we were in London in the UK, and from then, while we've been to Trinidad and Tobago and New Zealand and Australia and places, we haven't been able to be back in the Northern Hemisphere in a seriously meaningful way. And by that, I mean with an opportunity for as many countries in the world as possible to attend. And I just find that, that part of it so exciting. So at this point, we have 24 countries who have put in delegate credentialing forms. And that isn't a small task. They have to have the form signed off by appropriate people. They have to have some agreement within their association that they are the people who are the representatives. And you know, for some associations, there's a hierarchy. For some associations, it's about the best person for the job, regardless of any hierarchy. So there's quite a lot that goes on in the background for those delegate credentialing forms. So we have got 24 countries and 50 plus potential attendees. Now, these will not be confirmed until people start completing their registration form which I hope to have available for next week. I had hoped for this week, but it's going to be next week. The only reason that registration form isn't out yet is that we're just waiting confirmation of, um, of another sponsorship deal, which will help to bring down the registration price because this summit is purely on a cost basis. So the more re uh, sponsorship we get, the better price we're able to give to people um, as far as the registration fee goes. So I just find the fact that, yes, there are quite a number of European countries, but also Europe is accessible by so many other places. So there's European countries. We've also got Russia, which I'm not entirely certain is considered part of Europe. It's so big, it's part of itself. It's also... Um, North America, we've got um, the Caribbean, we've got uh, Africa and South Africa, we've got Australia, we've got New Zealand. I am just so thrilled with the number of countries that are coming because the number of countries that attend determines the number of administrative professionals individually that we can reach. And given the numbers who are attending and the numbers they have, have advised that they are able to share their information with, we are looking at a definite amount of 164,000 administrative professionals around the world. Now, each of those administrative professionals will be able to share further. And at that point, 164,000.
thousand, all cheering when five or ten people or twenty people gives us an unbelievable number of people who will be looking at the outcomes and results of our discussions. That, to me, is probably the most amazing side, both of the internet, but also of the location, and also of what I am now seeing a deep desire with the um, administrative professionals around the world, one, to have their voice heard through contributing to the recent survey, and two, so there's two parts that one is being heard and the other is to listen. And I think that's amazing. I think it's wonderful. And the other thing that I think is wonderful is that all the associations are working together. So you've actually got from any one country maybe three different associations represented. Yes, on the whole, we've, we've had one or two. But it's, it is making them. So in a couple of occasions, we've had four or more delegates apply, but we can only have three. And so we've gone back to those people and asked them to work together to determine which three people will be their delegates. And that is when we've got people working together. That has been a, an amazing experience, I have to say. Yes, and now you mentioned the survey that you put out, but there have been several of those, haven't there? And I know the last one in particular has had an incredible number of responses. Yes, the first survey went out in November, and that was um, an initial survey to gauge the types of topics. And that, that was reasonably well supported. We got really good information, and that we have now developed our interim agenda, because there could be some changes yet, and that is up on our website. The second survey was out for a month, and we deliberately chose a month because we wanted it to be shared. So it went to the first lot of people who were asked to share it, who were then asked to share it. And this in research is referred to as a snowball research tool. And we got 3,369 responses. Wow. And at times, looking at the data, I go, oh my goodness, how am I going to handle this? But thank goodness for a couple of things. One is SurveyMonkey that does an initial um, analysis, but also one of our team members works in an environment where they actually have marketing analysis tools and they're going to do further deep analysis with that, which is fabulous. So that closed um, a couple of weeks ago. I haven't yet been able to put out any of the results, but we will put one or two of those results out over the next few weeks so that people get a feel of what their information is saying to us. The main point of that survey was that in 2015 at the World Summit in Papua New Guinea, the Advisory Council, of which I am chairman, was asked to do further research on three topics. One of those topics was international credentialing, one topic was international networking, and the third topic was international position titles. And so this most recent survey was titled Position Titles, Tasks and Networking. So we pulled two of those topics together and gathered information for the research teams. And those teams are now starting to formulate their reports. The international credentialing team has also done an enormous amount of work, but they're not going to be able to come to any final conclusion by October 2018, so they will be putting forward an interim report because further research will be needed through to 2021 at the next summit. Now, the thing that you have to remember, particularly about the international credentialing team, but also about the other two, is that internationally, the type of work that the international credentialing team is doing has not been done by anyone. It's beginning to be done by um, qualifications authorities in different countries, but not with our sole purpose, which is about seeing how we can provide a framework for administrators around the world, looking at what's available out there so they can see what they need to be credentialed or qualified or certificated. So we're looking at 
academic qualifications, we're looking at professional qualifications, and we're looking at the certifications that have been put out by professional associations. You have to understand that the people who are doing this in all three teams are doing this type of research alongside their full-time paid work, their home commitments, their family commitments. And I am just so proud of the hard work that the team, the three teams have put in. And we're going to have some really substantial reports that go out to the delegates probably about early June for them to take and discuss with their administrators in their associations, in their organisations and in their countries so that they come to the World Summit with ideas that we can then discuss and agree and put out recommendations, suggestions. We can't do anything other than put out suggestions, recommendations and guidelines because we are not a formal body, we are an informal body. But you will be getting the biggest input that we have ever had into any of these topics. It is so exciting. It really is, and I know it's a subject that's very dear to your heart because you were one of the very first people in the world to do a piece of academic research on the role of the assistant, right? How did that come about? Yes, it, it came about, so so I, I had failed, but basically failed my final exams at school. I had not come out of school feeling anything other than rather limited in my abilities and, in fact, slightly stupid. When I became involved with AAPNZ and when I was heading into being national president, I had one of those light bulb moments when I took a comment made by my boss who said, given all the work that you do at um, your professional association and given the amount of commitment you do here, there, there should be some way that that could be recognised. And so I began to formulate what we in New Zealand called AAPNZ certification. When I was doing that, I realised that the biggest driver for me was the fact that the work that I had been doing at that stage for 25 years absolutely was a career, absolutely was a profession. And that was what was missing for administrative staff. They were not seen as professionals like engineers and teachers and doctors and lawyers and accountants. They were seen as doing work that women do. And yet I felt after 25 years at that stage that absolutely I had worked in the profession. So I thought, I'm going to make some noise about this. While I'm national president, I want to make some noise. But to make noise, you actually have to be able to quote research. So I had to go to have a look at the research, and when I looked for the research, there was none that I could find. And so I thought, well, bother, I'm just going to have to do the research myself. And so I
my own voice in there. However, what I did insist on is it had the voices of the people I'd researched. So my thesis unusually has a very high number of quotes because I did not want to lose the voices of the administrative professionals. Now, part of writing a thesis is you have to research the other literature. So I got the best researcher at Victoria University's library and he was able to find no more than 10 quite historical pieces of writing around this profession. They were all about secretaries, they weren't about the administrative profession in the wider sense it was that day. And so my piece of academic research was the first ever in New Zealand and most likely the 10th in the world, which is actually quite stunning because you think of what's being written about factory workers, about salespeople, about managers. You think of the research that had gone into those part of the workforce. And here we have this enormous number of women working in the administrative workforce and nobody was interested in looking at them. And I confess I can only judge that as being because it was considered to be women's work and therefore of lesser value. So, the World Summit is about to make a very big statement, and I'm proud, absolutely proud, to be involved with that. Totally. Can you tell me if, what were the main findings of your research? The main finding, in, in, real, in particular around the professional development opportunities and the career pathways, was the single biggest block to administrative professionals in gaining professional development or in developing a different career pathway was their lack of belief in themselves. What that did is it frequently stopped them asking. And so they never were given that opportunity to develop a business case because they never asked. And if they'd asked, they probably would have been told, well, Everybody else has to, to develop a business case to do their um, training that they want. You need to do the same and then got, get help on how to do it. And so they actually were talking themselves out of asking because they did not believe they were worth it. So the lack of value of self comes from the fact that society didn't value them, therefore they didn't value themselves. And it's still shown today. When people say, I am just a secretary, I am just an administrative professional, that word just is a very um, limiting and, and reducing word. And so I never want to hear anyone say, I am just a, because it goes along with saying, I'm just a mother, which also seems to women's work, and yet being a mother is one of the most important and valuable roles in your life. So it didn't surprise me that that was the case, but what surprised me was how clearly it was the single most important factor. Because often they were saying, oh yes, everybody in my organisation has access to training, but I wouldn't have if I can give a final message to anyone today, it is that the most important thing you can do is value yourself because that leads others to value you. And we've often talked about, and certainly in the presentations I've given to you, Lucy, or for you, Lucy, um, we all have a little voice inside our head and it often quacks rather like a duck telling us we're not good enough, we're not capable enough, we're not worthy. That little duck, we have to learn to shut that duck up because that holds us back. I couldn't agree more. Beth Lloyd, thank you so much for giving me your time. It's absolutely been my pleasure and thank you, Lucy, for asking me to do this.